how to pray in a spiritual warfare way. And from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Matthew 11.12 Advancing the kingdom Every disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to incorporate spiritual warfare into his, her prayer life. One of the first things a disciple must learn is that Jesus Christ who dwells within them is greater than anyone or anything in this world, including the devil himself. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4 verse 4 the heart of God is and always will be about souls. The advancement of his kingdom on earth is all about souls. This is why the advancing of the kingdom is so aggressive. Satan does not want one more person on earth to come to Christ. And when they do, he wants to make their life miserable and powerless. This can only take place if God's people fail to engage in prayer warfare. Ryan Johanning, a young minister of the gospel, received a very timely word from the Lord on July 20th, 2014. Holy men and women should not be content with all the darkness that invades their city, but rather contend and battle to bring forth light that will dispel the darkness. This is the way God's kingdom advances to bring in the end-time harvest. What does it mean to forcefully advance the kingdom of heaven? The context of the Matthew 11 verse 12 passage sheds some light on this. Earlier the imprisoned John the Baptist sent two of his disciples with a question for Jesus. Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus responded in an unexpected way. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Matthew 11 colon 4 6 The all-powerful ministry of Jesus moves powerfully upon mankind in the midst of violent opposition from demonic forces and those offended by his advance. Offenders are those who hinder proper conduct and put a stumbling block in the way of the advance of Christ's ministry. Jesus then points to the confronting style of John the Baptist's ministry and that of Elijah to reveal the forceful nature of the advance. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The only conclusion we can reach is that the advance of God's kingdom is not a soft, 
approach and certainly not a politically correct one either. Rather, it's one of spiritual conflict and warfare that opposes human agendas, corrupt governments, and demonic forces blinding people from the glorious gospel of Christ. This is why this strait of prayer is referred to as warfare or governmental prayer. The New Spirit-Filled Life Bible points out that there are four things needed for the kingdom of God to advance in the world. 1. An impassioned pursuit of prayer. 2. Confrontation with the demonic. 3. Expectation of the miraculous. 4. A burning heart for evangelism. Jesus also compared the generation to child's play in the same context. But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned to you, and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. Matthew 11 colon 16 dash 19 prayer warfare is not child's play and neither is the advancing of god's kingdom the holy spirit's power is designed to work through every disciple god's advance expands his kingdom rule and shakes things up the new spirit filled bible sums it up this way Jesus' references to the non-religious style of John and the confrontative, miraculous ministry of Elijah teach that the kingdom of God makes it penetration by a kind of violent entry opposing the human status quo. It transcends the softness of staid religious formalism and exceeds the pretension of child's play, it refuses to dance to the music of society's expectation that the religious community provide either entertainment, we played the flute, or dead traditionalism, we mourned. The upheaval caused by the kingdom of God is not caused by political provocation or armed advance. It is the result of God's order shaking relationships, households, cities, and nations by the entry of the Holy Spirit's power in people. Opposition to the advance of God's kingdom is formidable, but is overcome by disciples who engage in prayer warfare at the strategic levels. In fact, the Bible documents four main areas used by the enemy to oppose the miraculous kingdom advance. 1. Government, Acts 16 verses 35 to 40. 2. Religion, Acts 4 verses 1 and 17. 3. Business, Acts 16 verse 19. 4. All of the above together. Acts 17 verses 5 to 6. This is why prayer warfare at the corporate level is so important to the advance of God's kingdom today. It's important for disciples to understand that this warfare is also taking place in the heavenly places, and when they engage at this level they are making war in the heavenlies. We know this from Daniel who heard nothing from God for 21 days due to the warring in heaven and also the archangel Michael who wars against Satan and his commanders of darkness. Then he said to me, 
Do not fear Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Perhaps not every disciple is called to this level of strategic prayer, but every disciple needs to understand it and support it. Demonic armies oppose the purposes of God, and this is often reflected in people, religions, businesses, and governments on earth. The weapons of warfare. Disciples need to be trained in prayer warfare, and part of the learning process is to understand what believers are warring against. There are rules of engagement. The war is not against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6.12 Humility before God is essential in the battle because pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16.18 In fact, God himself resists battles against the proud but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4 verses 6 to 7. How would you describe the spiritual war and how would you rate your ability as a spiritual warrior or soldier of Christ? The Bible gives us a description of the war on three fronts. 1. The flesh. You have to fight and win the inward battle to be most effective in the collective army of God. The Bible describes this war as a boxing match. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Romans 7 22 23 Therefore I run thus not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. 2. The World You also have to deal with the spirit of the world, including the affairs of this life. Every disciple, spiritually speaking, has a military duty to fight this battle. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. 3. The Devil demons, and spiritual wickedness. You also need to make war in the spiritual realm, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6.12. The role of every disciple in prayer warfare 
is to enforce the victory of Christ in every place. To do this one must know the weapons of warfare and how to use them effectively in prayer. The number one thing that is in the world today, resisting the gospel of Christ at every corner, is the spirit of Antichrist. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. 1 John 4 verse 3 How do you fight this rascal when he seemingly has a grip on the hearts and minds of so many people and governments of the world? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. A closer look at the words used in the above scripture reveals both the action we are to take in prayer warfare and what the action is strategically targeted against. Put on the armor of God. How does a disciple enter into prayer warfare? The first thing is to put on the armor of God. The failure of many disciples to do this affects prayer at every level. A disciple cannot stand without God's armor. His armor is detailed in the book of Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 17. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Slash put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. A disciple needs to be a praying disciple who understands each piece of God's armor and how to dress himself for battle. First Peace Waist girded with truth, belt. Jesus is our truth. God's word is our truth. Oh, whenever we stand for truth, we should not be surprised if we come under attack. And all other armor are weapons of truth also. A belt of truth covers the middle. Truth will bring balance and stability. Attack may come through our fallen nature as men or women. And the full armor covers our nakedness, our vulnerability. As speaking the truth in love may completely stop the attack and win the victory. Quickly. Second piece. Breastplate of righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. We are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This piece covers vital organs of heart and lungs. Satan will try and condemn us by reminding us of past failures, present weakness, or future fears. 
Satan will want us to respond emotionally and negatively. Refuse to accept what the blood has removed. Continue to speak truth, not to defend yourself, but to bring light into darkness. Love those who are being used by the enemy to wound you. Remember that they too are being wounded as they are being used by him in the attack. Remain in an attitude of forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Remember who the enemy is. It's not people. Be quick to repent. Third piece. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shoes. Your stand will break up the fallow ground which Satan has held so the good news that God reigns can be planted. Truth brings peace. Continue to stand and to press on as the Holy Spirit leads. Do not defend. Press for peace. Standing firm. Pressing on will open prison doors even to those who are being used to attack us. We stand with the enemy under our feet on Calvary ground. Fourth piece, shield of faith. Christ's faith, his gift to us. Faith in his faithfulness. Faith that his finished work at Calvary is all that we need. Jesus and his works always stand between the enemy and us. He is our buffer and our shield. This is a mobile piece, so it is to move with us and to be used with other pieces wherever needed. Attack will come through doubt and condemnation, but we can resist in Christ's strength, not our own. Fifth Peace Helmet of Salvation Jesus wore the crown of thorns so that we might have a helmet of salvation. Often Satan's attack is mental. Confusion, weariness, trying to remember, and sorting out what is happening. Satan can at times distort speech. We may see or hear things that haven't been said or done. He can cause forgetfulness. Oppression and attack can come later in thought life. Why did I say that? Why didn't I say? Truth and asking what is truth will help us overcome. Be careful to repent of wrong or hasty words so that your thought life is cleansed by the blood. Cast down thoughts and take them captive. Sixth piece, sword of the Spirit, word of God. God's word is to be in our hands as well as in our mouths. We can speak it, but should do so carefully. God's word wrongfully used can wound people. Guard against self-righteousness and pride. We must continually offer grace and help the people while driving back our common enemy. Be at home in word and worship, so that the Holy Spirit can call forth the sword. We must be willing to hold God's word as all we need for life and godliness in every situation we encounter. How do you put this armor on? This is very important because most believers do not put on the full armor of God. Paul answers the question in this way, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Ephesians 6.18 we put on the armor of God by praying it on. How do you do this? Simply take each piece just described and pray like this. Lord, I thank you for your armor. I put on the belt of truth. 
I am your disciple, and your truth has set me free from all satanic bondage past, present, and future. Today, I can stand against the devil in battle because of God's truth. I take up the belt of truth in battle now. Then, go to the next piece of God's armor and pray it on. Keep going through each piece, and in this way, you will be fully dressed for battle. Use the authority of Jesus' name. Jesus sent the twelve and the seventy-fourth two by two, and gave them authority and power to heal the sick and cast out demons, even raise the dead. They recognized the authority was in his name. Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10 verses 17 to 19. It's telling to realize just how many disciples today fail to use the strong name of Jesus in prayer warfare. We lift up his name in praise and worship and also with thanksgiving. But why such shyness in exercising the authority of his name? There can be no other reason apart from that which Jesus gave to his disciples. It was because of their weakness of faith. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Faith in the name of Jesus is something every disciple must have to engage in prayer warfare. The Jewish exorcists and seven sons of Siva found this out the hard way. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul the first know. But who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Acts 19 verses 13 to 16. At one point the apostles asked Jesus to increase their faith, and he again told them what a mustard seed of faith would do if they faithfully exercised it in prayer. And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Luke 17 verses 5 to 6. In prayer warfare, this means speaking to the opposing spirit, In Jesus' name I command you to go. Or, you tempting spirit, 
I rebuke and silence you in the name of Jesus Christ. There is little difference when engaging in corporate prayer, only it's at a more strategic level against territorial spirits and strongholds over cities and regions. It's imperative for every disciple to understand that the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus has been granted only to those who follow him. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Mark 16 verse 17 Every demon cast out. Every stronghold demolished by an individual disciple or a collective group of Christ's disciples advances the kingdom of God. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke 11 verse 20 Pray in the Spirit. God is serious about teaching his disciples to pray at every level of engagement. However, modern disciples have built up an aversion to what the Bible refers to as praying in the Spirit. Regardless of what individual church doctrines say, God gives a disciple new tongues when he or she is baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit as recorded in the early church experiences. Although not the only way, a primary way of praying in the Spirit is praying in other tongues as indicated by Paul. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 14. This is Holy Spirit assisted praying, and there is a confidence with disciples who pray in the Spirit because the Spirit brings them in agreement with God. In addition, the Holy Spirit builds up their faith. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Jude 1 verse 20. Praying in the Spirit also creates a spiritual unity focused around Christ and the Father's business. We have the assurance that the Holy Spirit is directing us when we let Him intercede for us. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8.26 There are no understandable words that can be spoken when the Holy Spirit is praying through us. Our understanding is limited in comparison to him, so we need to pray in the Spirit and let him lead the way into the perfect will of God. Declare God's word. Jesus defeated the devil in the wilderness temptation with the scriptures. In all three frontal attacks he addressed the enemy with, It is written, on the final attack, Jesus declared. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan! For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Matthew 4 colon 10 11 Disciples today need to do the same. Faith declarations of God's word are propelled by the Holy Spirit from the mouths of his followers. They place the written judgment upon the enemy. The devil is fearful of this and his plans and strongholds are shattered when God's people declare his word. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? 
Jeremiah 2329 How followers of Christ view God's word is critical for every generation. You must pray in accordance with God's word knowing that the scripture cannot be broken, John 10 verse 35, and that it cannot be subjected to man's personal feelings and interpretations. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1,20-21 The word of God is not called the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians. 617. For nothing. How sharp is your sword? You need to use it in prayer warfare. For the word of God is living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews for 12. Pray through to victory. King Hezekiah was 39 years old when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, surrounded Jerusalem intending to engulf it with utter destruction and defeat. Hezekiah sent word to the prophet Isaiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy. For the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. Isaiah 37 verse 3 Hezekiah acknowledged their weakness and yet viewed prayer as their only possible hope. He took the blasphemous letter from Sennacherib and laid it before the Lord and prayed. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers, and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord, and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations in their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. Isaiah 37 verses 14 to 20. This is an example of the importance of praying through to victory. It was the second time Hezekiah had turned to prayer on the situation. A disciple cannot afford to give up and fall short in tough situations. You have to pray through till the victory comes. God's intervention was in response to the prayers. Then Isaiah the son of Amoz sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. Isaiah 37 verses 21 to 22. God fought for his people, and 185,000 were killed in the Assyrian camp in one night. 
Isaiah 37 verses 36 to 38. God himself defended the city and saved it for his own sake and for my servant David's sake. Isaiah 37 verse 35. In Christ, we have the same promise of victory when disciples pray through. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. A final word. The church with praying disciples can ward off any of Satan's attacks with a solid united front. Why do you need to be a praying disciple in concert with others? Because prayer opens doors so that the ministry of the gospel can be advanced with power in every place. We are on a triumphal procession with Christ, spreading his knowledge everywhere. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Although all believers have an individual prayer life to nurture and maintain, there is also a house of prayer where every disciple is needed. Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem before he entered and cleansed the temple, calling the people back to a house of prayer. Solomon prayed with his hands spread out to heaven. He recognized that God was far greater than the temple he had built. Nevertheless, he asked him to hear his prayer. But will God indeed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you, that your eyes may be open toward this temple day and night, toward the place where you said you would put your name, that you may hear the prayer which your servant prays toward this place. And may you hear the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel, when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. In the midst of Solomon's prayer, he prays for those who are not a part of God's people. This reveals that a house of prayer has an undeniable evangelistic purpose. Moreover, concerning a foreigner, who is not of your people Israel, but who comes from a far country for the sake of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray in this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. Second Chronicles 6, 32-33 Solomon dedicated the temple and specifically the altar for seven days with the people of God. Then they kept the feast for seven days. Once the people returned to their homes filled with rejoicing, the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night with a message that is quoted to the present day. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, 
If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Prayer is not the only thing that takes place in modern church services. Neither was it the only thing taking place in Solomon's temple, Herod's temple, or when believers gathered in the early church from house to house. Nevertheless, God's house is to be known as a house of prayer for all people, a place where anyone can seek the Lord and be heard by God. Watch therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21 verse 36